So, Canada, 2017, we, we live in this world of, of I thinks and I feel. You know, I can say, I think this about that, and you can respond with, well, I feel this about that. And for the most part in our culture, we're good with it. Well, that is in regards to eternity, but if we're talking about this life, like, you can't say that about politics or, or anything about race or sexuality or Okay, so there's a few things. Because if I say, I think this and this and this, someone will say, well, you can't say that. Or if I feel this and this and this, well, you can't say that. That's not polite. But it's interesting to me that these things are always based on earthly things. That when we move to eternity, it's like fair game. In regards to eternity, I can say, I think this and this and this, and it's all good. I can say, I feel this and this, and it's like open, you know? After all, the great theologian Oprah Winfrey once said, we're all just on different roads, but we lead to the same God. That's a very inclusive plan, Oprah, if you're listening. Um, And... And yet, it's very independently exclusive. It's saying, well, whatever I feel about eternity, well, then I'm right, and you can be right. Which is, which is okay, but now let's just for a moment, let's get an Orthodox Jew and a devout Muslim in the same room. (laughs) Everyone's like, oh dear, where's he going? All right. And you say to both these guys, um, let's even make it better. Let's up the ante. One's a rabbi and one's an imam. And we say to them, we say, excuse me, Rabbi, just so you know, in the end, we all make it, and you're actually going to be living next door in eternity to uh, devout Muslims. And I go to the imam, and I say, hey, by the way, we're all going to make it in the end, and so you know, you're going to be sharing a condo in paradise with, uh, with you know, a bunch of uh, Jews. That's not going to go well. And if I were to say that outside of Canada, let's say somewhere in the Middle East, I might not make it out alive. That's the reality. And so at least some of us on this planet, in this country called Canada, that, that some of us are, are seeking truth. That somewhere, somehow, there has to be some sort of truth. Someone has to be the right answer. And we can be as polite as we want in saying, well, you believe this, you believe that, and we'll all get there. It's fine and dandy until you start digging. Until you start really saying, no, I want the truth. We've been going through a series called The Greatest Book. Really looking at this book and asking, you know, is this true? It, can, we, can we trust this? Is this trustworthy? And, and today's message is called The Bible and the Christian Life. And, and what I hope to achieve is to show you that, that this book has, an, has a, very, um, a, a very exclusive plan eternally. But thankfully, it's very absolutely inclusive. And when we look at this book, we, we find that it, it leads us to questions and that this book holds the answers, and it points to one direction. And whether you're a new believer or a seasoned Christian, that this book will get you there. And so we're going to open, we're going to open to a passage in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, and it's a passage that we've studied quite a bit in the past couple of years here, as we kind of do this church revitalization thing, and, and, uh, we're going to go to it again and look at it in a little bit different light uh, because I, I believe it kind of encapsulates the plan and the purpose. And uh, just an initial shout out to uh, Pastor uh, David Dobson from Montreal. He was a pastor there for a lot of years. He's a retired pastor. He's an elder now there in Montreal. And he gave some of the sermon aids for um, study aids for this week's sermon. So I just want to give thanks where thanks is due. 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to look at 14 to 17. If you don't have a Bible, the Bible appears on the screen, or you can uh, look at under one of the seats, you can find a Bible there. And if you don't own one, 
and you'd like one, talk to the greeters, and they have one that they can give you, and you can have that. A reminder that this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, used by the Holy Spirit to teach his pastoral apprentice, Timothy. And First and Second Timothy have kind of become uh, trademark books for leadership and church structure. So let's look at this. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. It says this, But as for you, speaking to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the, with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the first thing that uh, that kind of that video intro talked about, and that we that that I believe firmly that the Bible does, is it is it outlines kind of one central message, one central message that the entire book points to Jesus either points forward to Jesus, actually Jesus talking about himself, or points back to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And, and this is what we see here. Paul outlines to Timothy, he talks about that he learned and then he believed. He learned about this thing, these sacred writings. And what he's referring to is the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, that all speak to this coming Messiah, that there's going to be a Messiah to come that's going to provide salvation for humanity. And that he came, and Timothy was a believer. But he started by learning the sacred writings. Well, who did he learn these sacred writings from? Take a moment and go one page forward, one page forward to 2 Timothy 1. And look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, again, speaking to Timothy, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. So not only did, did Timothy learn these sacred writings, these law, the prophets, all everyone pointing to Jesus, that, that his grandmother, his grandmother first believed in Jesus, his mother believed in Jesus, and there was a point, there was a point in, in Timothy's childhood where his grandmother and, and likely his mother in different points opened up the sacred writings and said, hey, I want to tell you about the coming Messiah. I want to tell you how Jesus has fulfilled these writings. That grandmother and, and mother didn't just say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus, and here he is. They pointed Timothy to Scripture. That Scripture was the thing where he learned and then he believed. And that's important. Because even today, people are still coming to know Jesus from the sacred writings. I recently heard an account from, uh, from a man from the Middle East, I believe from Syria is where he was. And uh, before the turmoil kind of happened there, uh, he was living there and he was studying. His whole world, world was Islam. He didn't know any Christians. He had, he had never heard the gospel. He had never experienced Christianity at all. But he was studying. He was, he was very devout religiously, and he was uh, kind of being mentored by an imam, and he was studying the different prophets. Now, Islam, in case you didn't know, does accept some of these writings. And they accept a man by the name of Isa. Translated means Jesus. They accept that there was a man named Isa who was a great prophet. And this prophet Isa captivated this guy to the point where he kept studying him. And he went to his mom and he says, hey, I'm studying the prophet Isa. And his mom said, yes, he's a, he was a great prophet, a great man, a great teacher, did many great things. Yeah, so, so, and so he went back and studied him. But, but then he had to tell his mom, yeah, but this, this guy Isa makes some pretty incredible claims. And I, I kind of maybe think that Isa is, is maybe more, a more important prophet than Muhammad. Didn't go well. And then he said, well, this, this prophet Isa actually claims to be the son of God. And, and I, I think I believe it. Well, this man actually had to flee for his life, him and his family. It was absolutely not allowed. Isa's a great prophet, but at the moment you start believing some of the claims that Isa makes about himself in comparison to other prophets, everything went south. And this man, through looking at the sacred writings and just exploring this guy, Isa, 
Jesus, he's now, he, he just fell in love with Jesus. He experienced the gospel. The Holy Spirit transformed his life. And now he, he serves the Muslim world trying to tell them about Isa using their own writings. And we find numerous accounts where this happens in Orthodox Judaism. Uh, there's a whole section of Judaism called Messianic Judaism. A bunch of Jews that firmly believe they found, they're like, hey, guess what? We've been pointing the Messiah, and he came. His name's Jesus, and, and we need to accept it. And th they fully follow a lot of parts of, of Jewish law and everything, but they believe that the Messiah has already come, and his name was Jesus. And, and even in Hinduism and Sikhism, they have this man, this teacher, this prophet, this, this guy named Jesus in all their religious books. And every once in a while, someone, I believe led by the Holy Spirit, starts looking into this guy, you know, Isa, Yeshua, whatever his name is in that language, Jesus. They start unpacking him, and then they come face to face with eternity this guy makes some claims that are vastly different than what we normally teach. And these sacred writings alone, without anyone, continue to bring people to Jesus. Next thing you know, they wake up one morning, they have the Holy Spirit, they've given their lives to Jesus, and they have the answer. The one central message that this sacred writings brings continues to do the work time and time again all over the world. Now, I'm not saying this isn't an excuse to not evangelize. That's not what I'm saying. We are still called to evangelize, but we need to use this book. It is amazingly powerful. But once we believe, once we believe, then we're brought to the one guiding purpose of this book. And, and this is where, you know, Paul says, this is why he called, he says, he says, it's God-breathed, breathed out by God. We talked about this a little bit last week, that, that God's very essence is in this book, that, that his life, his, who he is, is in this book. And this is what Paul's trying to get across, saying, when we digest this book, it's, this, this is a piece of God. This is his breath. This is his life. We digest this book. We experience God as, as a life. And then it comes in these four things that he mentions, he mentions teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And this is why it becomes the guiding purpose. Uh, teaching's pretty self-explanatory. This is what, what Timothy experienced with his mother and grandmother, that they taught him the scriptures. And through the teaching of scriptures, he found Jesus. And for those of us that are parents and grandparents, this should be convicting. If we are not opening up the scriptures or giving our children, our teenagers, access to the Bible, we're missing it. It's more than just talking about the, Bi the Bible or talking about Jesus. We need to give them access to it. We need to show them. And if we don't have answers to questions, they need to be able to ask, or we need to find them with me or the elders or seek it out. And, and so this is the one part, but then there's reproof and correction. And this is the difficult one. In the Christian life, there are going to be times where we go down roads that are just aren't good. We, we start taking on selfishness, arrogance, or our own ideas, or worldly ideas, and we start down a path. And, and we start down a path, and whether it, it doesn't matter what sin or, or what area is getting in the way, but eventually down this road— if we pick up this book, we usually realize that we're on the wrong road. And depending on how long it's been since we looked at this book, we can be a long way down the road. And the reproof is really the Bible telling us you've gone down the wrong road. You, you need to turn around. But turning around is super difficult sometimes because, you know, if you look at any 12-step program, Alcohol Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, the Christian version is Freedom Session. If you look at these, part of the road back to, to purity, what they take on is actually a very biblical concept. And that when you go down the road, when you've experienced the reproof and you, you actually uh, need to correct yourself, you've experienced the correction and you're actually coming back to the fork in the road to, to go on a new trajectory, sometimes you have to say to people, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? 
And there's this concept in a, in a lot of these programs, but it's based on biblical principle that, that we need to confess and seek repentance. And, and, and we need to talk to certain people and say, hey, I want to reconcile with you. I went on this road and the Bible has reproved me. It said you need to turn around and you got to go back to the, to the hinge moment where you made that decision. And, and I just, and you're a part of my journey and I obliterated this relationship and it was wrong and I need to go back. That the reproof is, is one part, but the correction is really difficult. But thanks be to God, we can get back to that, to that fork in the road. And then we can be on a new trajectory. And as long as we keep this and we allow this, this breath of God to impact our life over and over and we can stay on that road of correction, and then we start the process of training. Training in righteousness. That, that we are training like, a, like an athlete, in a sense, if we want to use that metaphor, that we are taking in and digesting this book, that we are coming more and more righteous more and more holy. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. And the end, Paul talks about, is that we will be complete and equipped. The other word used often, the translated word, is the word perfect. Not that we're never going to sin again, not that we're, you know, we're, we're perfect in that sense. We're perfect through Jesus. But the closer we get to Jesus through this book, perfection and equipping comes. And then Paul says that we will be equipped for every good work. But is it really about good works? Not really, because the good works, as we read the scripture and as we look at the gospel, that's where it comes full circle. Because the ultimate end of anyone who's a disciple of Jesus, if you see people who, who seem very righteous, that you look at their life and you're, you have no question, you're like, man, those people are close to Jesus. And, and even people who don't have a relationship with Jesus usually are like, man, that person... There, there's something there. But what we know is people that get close to Jesus and as they fully embrace him and as they embrace this book, they start to tell people about Jesus. And as they feel the fulfilling of this guiding purpose, this one guiding purpose, the good works are all pointing back to giving the central message, which is the gospel. And for a couple thousand years now, this has happened over and over again. People believe and, and accept the one central message of Jesus in these sacred writings. They start digesting it. They become righteous. They become holy people that, that are so close to Jesus that they tell other people who accept the one central message. And this thing goes on and on and on. And at the center is this book in Jesus. One central message, one guiding purpose. But here's the difficult part for the world around us is that this book and, and what Jesus said, it, it's not very inclusive. It's actually a very exclusive plan, a very narrow plan. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one gets to heaven. The way, the journey, I'm the only way. The truth, there is only one truth. This. And the life, the life for Jesus is the only way. Well, wait a second, Jesus. Come on, that's, that's uh, not very polite. Who do you think you are that you can say you're the only way? Don't, you haven't spent any time in Canada, Jesus, because there's lots of ways. And Jesus, you haven't been talking to Oprah very long either. Sorry, Oprah, that I brought up your name again. Call me, we'll chat. You, you mean, Jesus, that you are saying you're the only way? That there's no others? Are, are you saying, Jesus, out of all the different religions that are warring against each other and, and all, the, all the different ways out there, that you, in the person of you, in, in the person and power of you, you're claiming, Jesus, that you're it. That it's like one path through you, no others. Yep, that's what he's saying. There's nothing else. No one comes to the Father except through him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. 
very exclusive. But here's the good news. It's an exclusive plan, but it is, it holds absolute inclusivity. The same gospel, John, we read one of the most famous verses probably in the Western world. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever this means the guy on death row that's committed multiple murders, multiple rapes, a chaplain can go in there, can open this Bible and tell him about Jesus and the Holy Spirit can drop on that man. He can give his life to Jesus, repent of everything, his eyes are open, the scales are off, and he makes it. Jeremy, I don't like that. That's too easy. It gets worse. You can have someone who can work and do good stuff for humanity. They can do all sorts of social justice their entire life. They get to the end of their life and Jesus says that even when you call my name, I'll say, depart. I never knew you. That all the good stuff you do is nothing, means nothing in eternity. That it's the heart condition, not until you come face to face with the person and power of Jesus Christ, which these entire sacred writings point to, which tons of people all over the world continue, no matter how much they try to abolish this book, they continue to find this man, Jesus, and he transforms them. And, and this is it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that every single person on this planet, no matter how terrible or how good they are, they don't cut it. Even if they have one sinful thought, they don't cut it. There was only one man, Jesus Christ, that was perfect. He died on the cross, and on that cross, the sin of humanity fell. And in that moment, Jesus says, it is finished. Speaking to his Father, speaking to the world, saying, it's done. That the sin has been paid. And three days later, he rose from the grave, beating sin, beating death, and opening a way for humanity. Everyone. Everyone. And this is why multiple uh, murderers and rapists and people who have done the most terrible atrocities show up in random places begging forgiveness of the families they've hurt and talking about how blind they were and not until they met Jesus did they didn't even understand. Their minds literally get transformed. The demons and mental illness and just evil that consumed them before Jesus is gone. And doctors, psychologists, they can't understand how can this guy who lived 2,000 years ago transform a person like that? It's this book. And whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You will not go to hell. You will not be eternally separated. That through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, you will be saved. And we're going to we're going to sing one more song together. And as we do, for those of us that know Jesus, the, this, is, this is one of these times where, you know, we, we really should be moved to worship and thanksgiving that, that, that God uh, has revealed this to us. Uh, I was, I did a lot better in the second service. I was a mess the first one. Uh, good part of coming to second service, I got through it. Um, but, this, this should still consume us. It should still burden us. That there's tons of people, millions of people that, that are lost. And, and they're just good with not trying to dig into the truth and not really trying to find out. So this morning, uh, we're going to worship. I'll ask the ushers to come forward. Uh, if you need prayer, you can come forward if you'd like. And uh, we also worship through giving. The, the money we, we take in, so you know, we use to reach people for Jesus, to teach people about Jesus. That's our goal. That's our vision. It's not a, a guilt or a entrance fee. So if you're new, don't, don't feel obligated. Let's pray. Dear Father, I am so thankful for sending your son, Jesus. I thank you that, oh, I am a sinful, dirty, evil man, that you saw fit, that you loved me enough to send your son, to die on my behalf so that I may be made pure. Father, I thank you for sending your word. I thank you for thousands of people opening up these sacred writings and finding you. It's amazing. 
Lord, I pray that we would be consumed by this thought today that, that you chose to send your son for us. That you gave him up for us. May we never take that lightly. And Father, out of that, may we have a burden for the lost in our city. May you use us to reach the city of Whitehorse and beyond. May we be the catalyst. Father, I think a one story night, this is going to be an opportunity where people walk through and they may leave just asking all sorts of questions about Jesus. I pray that, that your word would be there or that someone would be there. Please use the, the offering that we're about to give. Uh, may it be sweet and pleasing to you, and may you bless it and use it to bring people to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.